dungeons on your tours? I only saw one dungeon and it had a very specific role, uh, torture. And it was very small. You could walk around within a couple seconds. It, it So it was a mini dungeon. And uh, so many torture devices that still cause me nightmares up to this date. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicky Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Hey, Realtors, on your way to a listing presentation, Zillow Showcase helps you stand out with sellers by putting their listing and your brand in the spotlight on Zillow. With Zillow Showcase, your listings can get prioritized placement, astonishing performance, and exclusivity. Showcase is designed to not exceed 10% of listings in a market. Don't wait to give your business the premium marketing and branding treatment it deserves. Visit showingtimeplus.com slash Spotify to get started with Zillow Showcase. Why aren't you wearing setting spray? Avoid makeup meltdowns with Urban Decay's award-winning all-nighter setting spray. A quick spritz locks your look in for up to 16 hours. Rain or shine, workout or night out. It's waterproof and guarantees your makeup stays put, no matter how crazy your day gets. With over 50,000 five-star reviews, Urban Decay's all-nighter setting spray is the best of the best. Get your Try Me size at Sephora. I had so much fun recording this episode with S.G. Blaze. Her first-hand knowledge of castles is mind-blowing. We go deep into the world building of these magnificent structures, covering real-world castles and their uses to their fictional representations. From defense and court life to waste management, or the lack thereof, S.G. takes us on a tour of anything you may want to know for your storybook setting. Stick around until the end, where we workshop a rather unconventional location for a castle. SG, thank you so much for joining me on Speculative Sandbox. I'm really excited to get to know you and talk about our topic today, which is castles. First, can you please introduce yourself and tell me and our listeners about some of your latest projects? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Vicky. I am SG Blaze. I was born in a faraway land of castles, monarchies, and fallen dictatorships, also known as Hungary. Mm. I'm a sci-fi fantasy author of a multiple award-winning series called The Last Lumanian. And um, that's pretty much it. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love that this podcast reaches people from so many different parts of the world. And uh, thank you for being on it. So I would like to start off with a rapid fire warm up just to get us ready to go. So these are half questions that are kind of just silly and then half that have to do with the theme. So let's start with the silly. Would you ever choose to live in a musical? Absolutely. As yeah. long as I, I just have to dance and not sing. <laughs> Fair enough. Which is worse, giving a public speech in your underwear or giving your unedited first draft to a stranger to read? Second one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> be a public speaker in underwear than have someone read my first draft. You'd rather you'd rather do the public speaking? Absolutely. <laughs> I think a lot of people probably relate to that. <laughs> do you still subscribe to traditional cable TV or have you moved over to streaming? Streaming for sure. Yes. I stopped subscribing when I was in college about 14 years ago, it was just more cost effective. And that was when like Netflix was around. And now the, all the, the network channels are moving over to streaming. <laughs> and now it's starting to feel like cable again. Okay. <laughs> of all the castles you could think of in fiction, which is your favorite? Well, it's part of one of a very favorite and cherished um, series uh, about a schoolboy. Is it Hogwarts? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I listed uh, Hogwarts as one of my favorites too. Okay. This is a which would you prefer? Would you prefer a castle, living in a castle that is currently under siege or living in a castle haunted by ghosts? Uh, under siege. I'm afraid of ghosts. 
<laughs> wow <laughs> you're braver than me i was like i'll take the ghosts any day <laughs> at least i have something to do right <laughs> yeah you're right you're right so t tell me about castles when we went back and forth on topic ideas you expressed an interest in talking about castles it's a very prevalent setting setting in fantasy novels of course we have them in the real world so tell me what you love about castles I love the idea of castles. I love the way they look. I love the purpose they have. And when I started out writing my novels, I had no idea there was so many information about them. For example, the dictionary defines castles as a large building that has uh, fortified thick walls with battlements towers and often a moat. What more do we need to know about castles? If they don't have a moat, can they be a castle? I don't think so. So it was a fantastic, uh, you know, start for uh, spurging my, uh, uh, you know, inspiring my imagination about what's possible and have this real life base. It was just a fantastic start. I love that. So I let's before we go into talking about castles, mm -hmm. obviously castle like in fiction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we take a lot of our inspiration from the real world. And so I did some quick research on just general information on castles. So according to the World Atlas, the oldest castle is the Citadel of Aleppo in Syria, with some of the structure dating back to 3000 BC. Then if you're wondering what the oldest castle still actively in use is, then that would be Windsor Castle, which was built in 1070 AD. And then finally, the largest castle is the Prague Castle in the Czech Republic, which is about 70,000 square miles. Oops, that's a pretty huge castle. I meant meters. So castles have been around for a really long time. What, what are your thoughts on why, why we built them? Why castles? Well, if you really think about it, they started out as a fortress and they were there to protect strategic locations or they were a military base for invading armies. So they had a very important role dating back as far as the Roman legionary camps. That was the first modern design for castles. And based on that designs, you know, they started to improve on this and they started to build more. And many of the, uh, you know, earliest castles date back to the ninth century. They are using this design, you know, that comes from the Roman legionary camps. So let's pretend that you are the, the, the queen of a fictional country and you have to figure out where to live. Is there a difference between castles that you live in to show off and party and castles that are those fortresses that you see at the end of edge of cliffs and is meant to, to barricade from the enemy? I think uh, when you can combine multiple function, that is the best. You know, when it's fortified, it have the thick walls, it has the concentric compounds. That's when it's really a safe place to be. Because, you know, monarchies, they're often under attack. You know, there were a lot of enemies. There were a lot of kings. It was almost like a revolving door for a time in European history. There were a lot of kings and queens who came in and, and went. So it was very important to have a castle that was fortified. And it was also luxurious to inspire people. You know, it was a statement of wealth. And, and a political center as well. So combining all of this, I think, is very important, both in fictional and in real life. That That's so interesting. So my first thought that came to mind is when they're fortifying, who are they fortifying against? Do they know who their enemy is? Are they worried about their own people uprising? What do you think? <laughs> I think it was a little bit of both. I think they fortified against their neighbors, frankly, because many of these countries, uh, you know, the border was often shifting. And also they were afraid of uprising for their own people. But um, I think that was a secondary thought because uh, one of the main purpose of castle is to protect people from invasion. And often people who were seeking shelter, they built villages around these castles. So it became less against the threat of your own people as a opposed to your neighbors so who's when fortifying i mean i'm assuming that you the leader are the priority do you put your villagers outside of the of like the safety zone um and how do you know like what goes what should go inside the safety zone and what can stay outside 
Well, I wouldn't put them outside, but it tends to be the case in real life. And that's because for many reasons, I believe, and one of them is not a nice reason, but I think it's just there was no room inside the keep. I don't know if you had a chance to visit, uh, you know, the, these early fortresses. They're not very spacious inside. So I think there was a, basically just lack of space. And then later when they were, you know, like big palaces that were built, those palaces, they were not fortified against attack. So their compound was fortified with stone walls. So having a village inside the stone wall was as safe as being inside a palace. Interesting. So I live in America and the closest thing we have to a castle is Hearst Castle, which is some rich dude in Southern California decided he liked all the different... It, it's basically the McMansion of castles. It's a McCastle. That's what it is. And he just took everything he liked from around the world and smashed them all together. And you can take tours. And I took I took a tour of that one. So no one, no one cared about fortification, obviously. It was just kind of one guy's hobby. But I'm assuming you've taken tours... I had the fortune to visit some amazing uh, castles and palaces, and it's uh, it never ceased to amaze me when you step the foot on these amazing structures that they're always smaller than what what you thought, you know, and and just there is this atmosphere around it, especially when they saw many battles. There is this atmosphere that's almost palpable, and and it's just a fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, um, trip to imagination of, you know, going back to history of what must have taken place here and how people lived. It's really fascinating. I, I love to hear that you you went and visited these places because I think that'll inform some questions that I have later. Because <laughs> when I want to build a castle in my head, and I have, like when I was a kid, I've written fantasy stories where there was a castle and everything. And there was a moat. There was definitely a moat around my castles. I like uh, that. But I had no idea. Like once my characters went into a castle, I'm like, uh, big room and somehow <laughs> halls get to, to places like, you know, this <laughs> kind of idea set. So I'm excited to hear more about like what that experience was. But can you tell me what was your favorite place that you've been the most remarkable one that just stood out and went, wow. Well, I have two places, and and the, the wow factor goes to a Hungarian castle called Egrivar, which is Ag Agri Castle. It is named of the city, and it also has a historical importance because it repelled the Ottoman army that was 30 times uh, the size of the defenders in 1552, and um, it showed amazing heroism, not just the men, but women fighting alongside with men, pouring boiling liquid I, I don't know if it was oil or water over the wall to pretend you know prevent people who tried to scale the walls uh the tour this is one of the castle I toured they took us underneath the castle it wasn't exactly a basement but this really narrow uh, corridor with short ceiling very claustrophobic which reminds you know the people weren't very short and well wide at mm. the time it was barely enough for one person to go through. And I believe it ran the perimeter of the whole castle. And from time to time, you would see these narrow alcoves that would just go to the side. And there was a drum, uh, you know, with a leather covering on, on in these alcoves. And the tour guide explained it to us that the reason for these barrels and drums, it was because they would place dried uh, peas on top of the drum. And when the enemy was digging tunnels to attack the castle from underneath, the pea would dance on the drum making a noise. So they were you're patrolling this corridor and looking for signs of tunneling, because that was one of the techniques to attack a castle. And this castle was in fact under siege for months from cannons just blasting the wall. So they had to live under siege for months. And, and even then they couldn't take the castle at the first run because uh, the Hungarians, we were like, we're not giving you this castle. So they would, uh, supposedly they would go out at night, like a hundred, uh, you know, people on horse, attack the sleeping camp and then go back. And at some point, there was a rumor about, uh, you know, around the Turk camps that the Hungarians were drinking bull's blood, which would give them, uh, you know, inhuman power, superpowers, because they couldn't phantom how this 1500 people can stand up to a 20,000, uh, you know, deep army and stop the 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 siege, because the plan, the original plan for the Ottoman Empire was to go all the way to France. 
Mm, okay. And this castle along a couple others, it, it, it stopped this huge momentum. Remember, there's not a lot of media news, took weeks to spread. So when this army stopped in a country for months, everyone knew the Ottoman Empire is coming. So they stopped this momentum. Unfortunately, the castle uh, did fall in 1596. And that also was part of that um, oppression when the, the Ottoman Empire stayed in Hungary for 150 years. If you've blown my mind. <laughs> like, that is amazing. So they were able to keep off a, a, an invading army that was way huger than them because they had all this like essentially infrastructural technology to to be able to know when they're coming up to they pour oil over the walls how come other castles weren't onto that yet is it because they didn't have exposure yet they didn't have the skills they didn't have the right talent on their staff <laughs> Something like that. Well, I believe when this army arrived, they were attacking the strategic fortresses. So they were more fortress than castle. And if you can see it by the, you know, the design. So the, the goal was to take this fast in a couple of days and then keep going to the next country and then the next country until reach basically France. But when, uh, you know, these, these castles, these fortresses put up such a fight that it took weeks or months to take them, that momentum suddenly came to a jarring halt. And that's what, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, protected most of Europe from this, this uh, enemy that had a, one goal in mind, is to take over Europe. And uh, we paid the price, <laughs> wow. frankly. That's amazing. Okay. So then now that you've, you've talked about touring, can you aesthetically, just aesthetics alone, look at a fortress, look at a castle and go, I know what culture that is, what that's calling from, what location that is? Like, Are there significant aesthetics factors that play into the, the creation of these castles? I believe you can definitely tell the difference, for example, based on the building material. You know, the earliest medieval castles in Europe were constructed from earthwork and timber. And then, of course, over the next few centuries, uh, the timber it was replaced by stone. And by the 13th century, there were all kinds of big stone towers popping up all over. The other thing that can help you to distinct, distinct between castles is the shape. You know, freestanding, uh, rectangular-sized stone keep castles were very popular in, in uh, among Normans. And in England, these were more square-shaped. And then lastly, it's not just Europe and Great Britain who has castles, but all over the world, other countries had castles and many had very distinctive style of architecture. Just to name one, Japan, it's, a, you know, their castles are and palaces, a very distinctive style. And even mm -hmm. in the United States, as you said, there are castles. <laughs> yep. <built up laughs> Hyphenated. <opposite>. Yeah. <laughs> Parentheses. What was it? The Quote, air quotes, castles. Exactly, air quotes, uh, you, know, you know, built by wealthy businessmen, but they were more for the static reasons. So I think mm -hmm. castles are just something we've all, we've been fascinated and we always will be fascinated by. My exposure to castles has been Disney. So <laughs> Sleeping Beauty's castle, the castle at Disneyland, Beauty and the Beast's castle. What, what was their main uh, inspiration? I know it was the German castle. I'm terrible with names. I, I had it written down at some point, and then it went out of my head. Because these notes are dating back almost 10 years ago. So so I had to brush on my knowledge. And the first thing I forget is the numbers, you know, dates. And the second thing I tend to forget is name of castles. So I know it's a German castle, but do not ask the name. <laughs> I am the same way. I'm like, there's only so much information that fits in this head. And, and as the time goes and I get more information, my brain's all like dump you know all the old stuff so I totally feel that okay so let's talk about world building a castle all right we're writers we're sitting down okay we're gonna create a castle we've yeah. talked a lot about its purpose and how it's been used but when we start looking at the blueprints what informs the makeup of a castle where are like the where the horses go versus the where the soldiers go versus where the king and queen sleep like is there proximities tell me about that Absolutely. I think we, we should start with the type of castles. And there are three types of castles. And the first one is called the Mutt and Bailey. And it's the Bailey, this, this uh, um, compound that has a palisade that houses many buildings, depending on how big the compound is. And there could be stables, 
barracks, kitchens, multiple kitchens, uh, a chapel, stores, workshops, you name it, they may have it. And some of these, uh, you know, uh, mutt and bailey castles, they would have multiple baileys. But basically, it starts with a very simple timber fortress. And, and that's next to this, uh, you know, uh, uh, compound that has the palisade. So is that's that the first like, basic. Is that like Queen Elizabeth now, where she kind of like where she lives and there's apartments and there's like all these like horses and I think they probably were inspired by that, right? Because okay. it's the first earliest design. But of course, they they upgraded the Martin Bailey with stone material, which is our second type of castle called the Stone Keep Castle. And now you see these existing, uh, you know, buildings, but they use stone material to replace the timber whenever possible. However, sometimes the stone uh, was so heavy that they weren't able to upgrade the fort that's, that stood on top of the hill, which is the mud. So they were actually upgrading the timber palisade into stone palisade. So that way they still fortify the whole compound. And then lastly, we have the concentric castle, which is, I think, the most defendable castle. And that's because it has towers connected by curtain walls around the concentric shaped compound and usually there is more than one of these compounds built one into the other creating multiple of these compounds with an inner wall outer wall often following the shape of the hill and it is a fantastic uh, you know design it's very defendable because the inner walls are usually higher than the outer walls. So like the crossbows, they have a clear sight of line to the attackers. And some, you know, debate that the emergence of this type of castles was because the, the siege engines and siege technology developed to combat against the stone keep castles. And uh, the stone keep castles used to have walls that were like seven meters thick. That's 21 feet. So they had to develop stronger, more powerful siege engine to blast through that. Remember that Agri Castle probably had walls that thick. So that's why uh, many believe that concentric castles were created because now you have to go through multiple stone walls and that will slow down any army's progress. Do castles, aside from being able to show off and be a symbol of their country and have a pretty cool place to stay, does it still serve its purpose as far as defense goes in the modern day? In the modern day, I think, uh, I don't think they were preparing for air attack. Mm -hmm. So unless they were preparing against dragons, which I'm pretty sure they didn't. I prepare against dragons, but that's just how my brain, my brain works. But I think uh, with the, the way technology developed, uh, you know, and we have all kinds of... Uh, uh, military aircrafts, uh, they can probably take a castle in, I don't know, minutes, hours. <laughs> Very Unless <easily>. those <laughs> castles are, are, have specific air artillery to defend against such attack. And I'm pretty sure the Buckingham Palace didn't install, uh, you know, those type of artillery. Maybe they did and they just keep it in some of the, the you know, uh, bastions or towers. We, you never know. But I think the modern technology made castles not as great a place to, you know, um, you know, defend. How OK, so traditional castles and back in the day, how accessible were they to the public? Was it only VIPs allowed in or were they situations where anyone could come in and watch the, the king and eat with his people? <laughs> I believe those who were part of the court, they had a bit more freedom to come and go. But uh, usually it was the Lord or the King who decided who has access. And there were all kinds of protocols and attic rules that they had to follow. And then when it comes to the, you know, the villagers, uh, they may had uh, visiting, uh, I don't know if you're going to call it visiting hours, but, mm -hmm. you know, time when they could see uh, either a Lord or some representative of the Lord to, to you know, get some of their daily issues uh, debated or, or have someone to, like, a, a judge sit over so definitely not uh free for all and open all times 
and um, there were reasons for both safety and and uh, well frankly for the caste system right? right we had the king we had the lords and then villagers and pretty much that's it right mm-hmm. so would you say that the courts the court system is always fascinated me i was a huge bookworm when it came to like king henry the eighth and his wives and just learning like that's my first exposure to court life would you say that it's consistent across like all major you know royal families with castles um that they have like that kind of inner circle mid inner circle uh, where they call it a court i'm pretty sure it was fairly consistent i don't know if they were copying each other's or they had the same you know advisors and uh, but there was definitely, you know, uh, you had the head of a, a country, a monarch, and then he had uh, certain people he trusted, you know, one or maybe more to advise him in certain matters. Sometimes the wife had the, the queen had the privilege or they had uh, concerts, you know, it was often the case to have more than one. Um, but it was a fairly uh, similar type of court that, of course, over each century, it evolved and changed, you know, with the, the Renaissance and so on and so forth. So they were very, fairly consistent, I believe. Okay. I am an assassin in a character, <laughs> like in a book, and I need to break into the castle. What are some ways that I can get in? <laughs> well, first of all, I would call my trusty uh, dragon and fly in, mm -hmm. and then would try to attack from uh, on, from the top and make sure that I would quietly take out a guard. I don't like killing, so just put them to sleep and then go through the tower and find... Because once you're inside the castle, it's usually a lot easier to avoid guards and find the, the master uh, sweet suite of the king. That's how I would approach it from the top. Okay. And if, okay, here's another scenario. If I was a member of the staff and I was slipping secrets around, would I, would there be like hidden passageways or what would be the best way for me to be devious? Definitely use the hidden passageways. There are many of these passageways for many reasons. I don't know if it's the, the English castles or Scottish castles, but Many of them, <clears throat> excuse me, had secret passageways to smuggle uh, goods in and out. I don't know if it was a lot of pirates, uh, you know, going on, but many castles have passageways for smuggling reasons. So I would take advantage of these passageways and and I would never go back because once you take a, a, an important uh, diplomatic scroll, they know, they know that who had access and you can never go back. Okay, let's pretend this is a young adult fantasy romance. So I'm like a 16 year old girl and I'm sneaking. Maybe I'm a hmm, maybe I'm a princess. I'm sneaking through the castle and I'm going to try to find my love is are, are there are towers a thing where you climb up to the top of the tower and you overlook and you have owls living up in the tower. Clearly, clearly my experience of castles is Harry Potter. <laughs> like, but yeah, how would you envision that sneaking out at night? You know, the, the daughter that shouldn't be doing this, but she's doing it anyway. And who would she be loving? <laughs> well, try to find, you know, the 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 easiest way through the castle to get to the bailey or 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 inner court courtyard or find that secret passage um avoiding guards of course or maybe you have a guard who is or a, a, a maid who's very helpful and would you know uh, let you know when it's time to come back or keeping that door open i'm sure there were doors that would only open from the inside so someone must have been staying there to make sure you can come you can get back inside the palace or castle Ooh. Oh, yes, I would need friends. <laughs> uh, is there, I always see dungeons. There's always dungeons in the basement. Um, have you seen dungeons on your tours? I only saw one dungeon and it had a very specific role, uh, torture. Ooh. And it was very small. You could walk around within a couple of seconds. It, it, so it was a mini dungeon and uh, saw many torture devices that still cause me nightmares up to this date. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there's okay. a reason we keep it right in the in the secret basement <laughs> yes oh my god I, I used I fell down a google rabbit hole like a couple of, like well actually like 15 years ago when I discovered medieval torture devices one day and I was like you know wikipedia I'm like what and I was just so disturbed by the very creative ways that medieval uh -huh. leaders came up with ways to kind of coerce you to say things 
it's twisted and extremely brilliant and extremely inhuman and twisted. And I don't know if I should be in awe or horrified or both. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Um, any other in real life castles you want to talk about oh. or even fictional ones? Absolutely. And one of my second favorite castles is more like a palace, is the Schönbrunn Palace in Austria. And it is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to its historical significance and its amazing layout. Now, this is the layout, which is, is to me, it's fascinating. It has over 1400 hundreds room, but it go in almost like in a line. So you go from room to room to room to room. I didn't see a lot of corridors and I don't know how many uh, stories, maybe five, six stories. I don't remember exactly, but it's just fascinating to have 1,400, over 1,400 rooms. Yes, that's, and that's amazing. Great. Exactly. And crazy large amount of land. And this castle, this palace became uh, the focus of the Austrian court when Maria Theresa, a Habsburg empress, who was also a Hungarian queen and the mother of Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France, she basically made this summer palace into the focus of the court life. And she had, uh, she hosted many statesmen, monarchs, and it became really important seat of the Austrian uh, em empire. And also it was the home of my favorite empress, Sissi, who is known as, uh, you know, also known as the, the empress Elizabeth. And she was the wife of the Habsburg Emperor of France, Joseph. And I love uh, her story. It's it, talk about the, the most romantic story in history, the way they fell in love. And I believe there is a TV show on one of the Netflix, uh, right? It's a TV show. Mm -hmm. I don't know how historically correct that one, but there are books, movies out there. So I've always been fascinated. And the parks are open all year round, free of charge for the visitors. So I highly recommend anyone to go and visit. It is unbelievable experience to walk the grounds. And you can spend a whole day there just walking around to explore the gardens, multiple gardens, garden labyrinth. Fascinating. Wow. They even had the smaller uh, palace, Gloriet, I believe was the name. And I don't know if that was the winter palace or the tiny summer palace for the summer palace. It used to be cafe at one point. Uh, it's just, and the view, unbelievable. So they must have built that giant castle to have, to need to use all the rooms at one time, which means I'm guessing their court is massive. They have a big court. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so then here's a funny question. This is an essential <laughs> question. This is my local government coming out. Okay. <laughs> so, we're, um, how, When was it built? Did it exist in... I'm not sure when it was built, but I know that it became part of the Habsburg, you know, the possession of the Habsburgs around the 16th century. Okay. I'm pretty sure it was built before that. I don't know who owned it. Okay. There was a lot of kings and queens in all these countries, so it's hard to keep track. How did they handle sewage? Well, they had to upgrade that a lot of times. And I know they had a kitchen in, in a separate area and it was it was like a, a like a almost like a mansion itself just to serve a palace at that size. And they had hundreds, if not thousands of people, you know, from servants to gardeners to guards to keep up. So the upkeep of this palace must have been very costly, which shows you how wealthy the Habsburg Empire was for a, for a very long time. Okay, so then applying that question to fantasy medieval <laughs> castles, how do you handle how do you handle the rest? Is that why there's a moat? Like, you know, like, do, does it all go into the moat? <laughs> um, yeah, I hear about like kings using a porter potty, essentially, with a long chute that goes straight down. And then some other people have told me that there's like a staff member or I don't know, servant who wipes the king for him. I've heard so many crazy, bizarre things. So what is a good direction to go for people wanting to know how to structure bathrooms? Well, you definitely want to have the, the switch to go out of the building, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a bit of a Captain Obvious moment here. And possibly into a river or ocean to carry it away. If that doesn't exist, then you have to build a, a sewer system or you have to, your country 
have to have some kind of a sewer system. Otherwise, it would end up on the street, mm -hmm. which often was the case in many European countries that the sewage was just dumped on the street. I mean, talk about the, the plague, how many times it, it went through Europe, you know, and, and probably one of the main reasons was for that is they dumped the, the stuff on the street. It was very it's smelly back then. Yeah, and people got used to it. Can you imagine when you get used to that kind of smell? That's that's bad. Yeah, and and that attracts the rats and the rodents and the cats and you know all oh. the things that carry all the things. <laughs> oh yeah, and rats bring the bubonic plague or whatever mm -hmm. it's called. And but if you really think about it, talk about a great uh, defense system. Supposedly, when um, Attila the Hun uh, attacked the Roman Empire. It, his army was taken down not by the defenders but by bacteria they all got uh this dysentery dysentery or something uh, yeah diarrhea dysentery. They got, yeah dysentery. yeah they died of that wow. many of them died before they were able to cross the gates of the empire Do you think that's so it's a good defense system uh yeah i now that i'm thinking about it that should be the way you should like if you know someone's coming right don't even let them get to you take them out like put stuff in their food <laughs> okay Anything. so oh any other fantasy castles you want to talk about well you know one of my other favorite fantasy castle is the one that i was able to construct for my very first book uh in the last slumanian and i started with actually the location before i started with the the type because okay. it's very important to have natural defense on possibly three sides okay. because yeah. if you have ocean on one or two sides and you have mountain on one or two sides that's a natural defense that's priceless it's invaluable and then you start with the type of castle which usually the concentric castle is the most defendable and then you go from there and i i went to the point where i added the the twisting corridors i don't think it made it a lot of them into the books because there was not a an attack inside but uh i had this whole design i drew it by hand that you know twisting corridors that would narrow down to one person with a lot of choking points and all kinds of traps and yeah i ran with it is that why castles are common times against the ocean because is the ocean considered a natural I think, so. I think so now the ocean is the best right and and even in real life i built my castle the una the crystal palace on una i built it into a mountain and I've, when I did my research, I found a couple of them that were actually did the same. It wasn't completely in the mountain, but one side of it was definitely against the mountain wall. So that was a very interesting inspiration to me to see it's possible to do. Plus, it also shows you the power of the monarch, you know, that he can say, start carving that mountain out. We're going to have a castle in there. That's wow. a very powerful statement. Wow. Yeah. Well, that makes me think of like even like other cultures that had their people do massive tasks for vanity, essentially, like the the all the big uh, pyramids in mm -hmm. Egypt that takes a lot of time and labor to make those pyramids. So then you have your burial place, you know, and <laughs> it just kind of blows my mind, like the ability to create these massive structures um, for this, you know, rel not religious for this. um well, yeah, authoritative yeah. figure that can many times have religious uh, affiliations. Yeah. Um, I have okay. I asked the world building questions. Oh, I did ask about what informs the makeup of. I, I did want to ask what informs the makeup of the castle based on the natural resources in the area. You talked about that as far as like what materials are used to build it using natural defenses. Is there anything else that goes into, like, I'm looking at a map and I want to mm -hmm. plant my flag. Any other things I should consider? Well, they usually they were aiming for the hill, you know, top of a hill. And if they didn't have a hill, they would actually make one. And as wow. they were excavating the earth, that ditch became the moat around the those earliest the mutt and bailey, uh, you know, castles. And and the mutt is the earthwork or, or the hill itself. So I'm pretty sure they started with looking at because uh, being on top on a higher ground is very beneficial for many reasons. You get to see, you know, who's coming far more, far uh, earlier than the attackers think. 
And also, um, you know, when you're on top of the hill, you have areas where you can do for agriculture, you know, create fields because you're going to need food to support the people, right? So you can have orchards, you can have fields, uh, grains, you know, the village uh, was relying on those areas. And then, of course, they would bring the harvest into the castle. And then um, one of the interesting thing is that the Mutt and Bailey castle was also the type of castles that were very popular during uh, feudalism, which was a pop, uh, a very interesting time in Europe where all the lords or, or kings, they were creating fiefdoms, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the peasants, the villagers who were working the field for, for exchange of giving portion of the harvest, they get to be there. They had a house. They didn't have to pay for the house. Of course, it didn't last for long. But basically, you definitely want to have natural sources close by so that you can rely on that. That's a really good point, a food source. You got to feed yourself. You got to defend yourself. You got to do something with your waste. Mm -hmm. I don't think if there's anything else. Um, recreation. Hmm? There was a, like the, they did a lot of recreational stuff for the king and queen. Like from what, from what I'm, I know they do a lot of parties and stuff like that. Would that extend to the rest of the village that's outside the castle? How can people think about festivals and just events like the holidays? I mean, there's many, uh, you know, states in, in America that, that have Renaissance fairs and they have a base of historical uh, facts. They used to do tournaments, right, the, between the knights, among the knights. And and so they would do jousting, right? Um Night's Tale is one of my favorite movies, even though it's it's kind of like a musical. I just love the way they portray those times and have a little modern music playing as <laughs> yeah. it has been, you know, happening. But, you know, they would do jousting. They would do, you know, um, they would have entertainment coming, you know, um, uh, jugglers, clowns, uh, the earliest uh, the theater, you know, kind of thing. So they definitely had outdoor entertainment. And of course, they had the fair where they would have people set up a little booth to sell their uh, harvest, you know, overflow or or those meat pies, <laughs> spiced wine, anyone. So there was a lot of, um, uh, of these events. And I'm sure the, depending on how rich the Lord or the King was, these events could get quite big. There are a ton of castles out there, and some, I hear that many of them are abandoned. Some of them have homes. So what's going on with these castles? Why are they, why did they stop being what they were? Uh, well, you know, Industrial Revolution happened, right? Uh, so that uh, changed the way of life. You know, we moved away from monarchies to democracy. We didn't need that powerful statement of this is the seat of of the king because we stopped having kings, you know, in many countries. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the technological improvement uh, basically ended a very uh, interesting era where we needed this you know, military base that became a political seat it was also economically functional, you know, because of collecting the harvest and all that to becoming, we're moving away from, uh, you know, villages to creating urban uh, cities and so on and so forth. You can't have a castle in the middle of uh, New York City. That would no. be problematic. You know, I mean, the, on the Gilded Age, they did have fortified mansions that look like, you know, mm, almost yeah. castles. But even those, how many stayed, uh, you know, behind? Not many survived the, the time and also the technological advancement. Do you think that's a combination of maybe resentment, but also maintenance costs? Because my, my thought was, could have those, could they have been repurposed for something that benefited the community rather than just one or two individuals? Well, I'm sure some of them got repurposed. So, someone I was just talking uh, the other day, one of my friends, she mentioned that she saw a church that was a castle before. Okay. So often this happens, you know, um, many castles get abandoned because the family dies out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no one else to, to take care of it. And maybe it gets forgotten or the, the government doesn't want it because remember, they don't have the, the appropriate sewer, the electrical stuff. So to bring many of these ancient buildings into the 21st century could be quite costly. And when you try to preserve the historical value, you don't want to injure the building just so that we have electricity or working mm. toilets. Yeah, that would be quite an overhaul. Mm -hmm. 
There is a Netflix movie that came out, not this last Christmas, the Christmas before. I believe it had Brooke Shields and Carrie oh. Elwes. Do you know what oh, I'm I talking about? Oh, yeah. I had to watch. It's it's a romantic movie. I yes. was so there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's about an author who is in a like a writing slump. She's hit a wall. And she decides to, what country do they go to? I is think uh, Scotland. England. England? Okay. England, I think. She goes Sounds there, good. and I think because she has some her- history there, her father used to work somewhere, and so she's at a local pub or whatever, and she wants to check out this castle that's for sale. And the guy that you know takes care of the castle is Carrie Elwes, who's just a delightful, delightful man, and they fall in love, of course. But the whole point is she's trying to buy this castle, and I was like, can I just go around buying castles with my author salary? <laughs> I'd have to be... A best-selling novel. I have to be Stephen King <laughs> or Colleen Hoover. If we can afford a castle, that castle probably is not worth it to buy it. Ooh. So we have to be careful. <laughs> that's a fixer-upper for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless that's what that was the goal there is to to fix it up for yourself, right? But mm-hmm. uh, I, I I see on the news from time to time some of these castles pop up uh, and they're for sale, but they're tiny inside. They may be two three bedrooms, right? Oh. So it's a uh, or, or rooms. They're not bedrooms. They're rooms. So it's very interesting when that happens. And I I always think about it, dream about and buying it and then I start imagining the work that it goes in there and then I'm over it (laughs) oh (laughs) fair enough okay so I have one last exercise I wanted to do this is where I was going to test not test we're going to workshop we're going to workshop a concept I wanted to be kind of ridiculous about it so let's see what, what goes on what would you do if we have to create a castle in the side of a sleeping slash semi dormant volcano (laughs) <laughs> well i would definitely be very very scared <laughs> <laughs> I, okay i, I have one you. idea i have one idea like well, uh, and this is very short sure. it's <laughs> it's very specific but i was like you know how they have like air vents and like toxic gas gets leaked out that's yeah. your tor- that's your that's your dungeon like, right. like you have <laughs> that could do help you out there but that's all that's far as i got what what are your thoughts <laughs> well i would make sure to to have some cliffs and rocks to direct the lava flow away from the castle so that can became a, a natural defense right there and then we're on the other side and we're like we're protected from ash and and lava so good luck to you um but other than that i would not dig too deep into that volcano and would make sure that the there would be some protection against the falling rocks that goes in every direction when the lava erupts so probably try to have a natural like awning or something to protect the castle it would be a tiny castle yeah. more like a mansion well i i thought no one would want to attack my castle in the side of the volcano because i'm like try it do it like you know like come on and you know they'd be like no oh, like this is crazy and i'm like okay what is the benefit of volcano i'm like what if there were dragons in the volcano and you wanted to tap that resource so you, well, I think I think it's most mostly fire golems who live in volcanoes. So okay. you have to be friendly. You have to make sure you feed them. So you know would have to have like bonfires and stuff to ensure that they know we appreciate their presence. And and then you know we would not feed them when an attacking army comes. So they would fight for us. I think there are a lot of ways to take advantage of volcanoes, especially if it's a fantasy volcano. Oh, perfect. Well. Anyone out there that wants to build a castle on the side of a volcano, you are welcome. We got to did some work for you. <laughs> All right, SG, thank you so much for joining me today. Are there any last notes that you want to give? Oh, I had a blast, uh, you know, looking through my notes and world building and reacquaint myself with the castles and just the, all these tidbits that were fascinating. And and to to look through the world building, uh, you know, I did for the first book that unfortunately not all of that made into the book because it's not info dump. That's not the mm-hmm. purpose of a book is to have info dump. But it was a fascinating, uh, you know, research and all this world building materials that went into the last Romanian and and only 10% of it made it into the pages. Wow. So it was very interesting to see, you know, I had all the sewage notes, the garbage, who does the garbage, uh, what are they importing, exporting. One day, one day it's going to make the day of light or light of day and um, the readers get to read about these tidbits, I hope. I think that'd be so much fun. Plus you have the real world experience 
of touring these castles, which once you've lived and breathed it, like that sticks with you. And that really helps when you can build a world inside your head that's based off of that experience. Um, one day I will leave my corner of the world and I will check out a castle that isn't just a rich guy's, you know, show off piece. <laughs> and although I guess maybe you could say that's what they all are, but um, one that's a little bit more legit and go overseas and check that out. Um, but yeah, um, how can our listeners find you and get your book? Listeners can find me on sgblaze.com, which is my website where they can see a lot of character illustrations, maps, content. I also have a newsletter. They can sign up and get all uh, information of upcoming events and, uh, you know, next book. I'm also on social media. I have an Instagram account. I believe it's sgblazeofficial. And I'm also on Twitter, sgblazeotter. And I have a Facebook page, uh, The Last Domanian. And um, I love when readers uh, ping me they let me know if they you know whether they like the book and what they like the book and and I'm trying to get uh, freebies in my newsletter what people can download and enjoy and and get to learn about this uh, world that uh, the seven galaxies you know final question would you ever want to be queen or be in the royal family Oh, I'm I'm already a queen in my family. I don't know if we if we should have started with that, but I'm also a bona fide self-proclaimed princess. So I have two titles. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.